Welcome to another video. It is about time, I know. Even Nurgle has been pissed off with me being late in the producing of this video. So he infested me with a damn plague for the past month or so. You'll have to forgive my voice. Is that or no video at all? Thanks, Nurgle. You suck. Well, with no further ado, let's dive into the second part of the Enemy Within campaign. The Death on Rake. This adventure has reminded me of one important aspect in running role-playing games. Yes, overarching plots are amazing, and they need to be in your game to make them interesting and coherent, but as it happens in life as well, things will not always go your way. And when you might plan for something, something else might come up and you have to deal with before returning back to your main goal. When I accepted that rule in my game, things started to become a bit obvious and way more fun in so many ways. So here your players might have been coming out of a historical destruction, witnessing and even participating in a way to an unholy and blasphemous ritual that opened a gate of chaos in the city of Bogenhafen, and now they are on the run. But while they are doing that, they are planning their next step. Things are happening around them, and they have to react to them. Down the road, if the overarching plot was strong and interesting enough, you will find a way to intertwine it with your current story. Or even better, your players will come back to it like mad dogs with a bone to pick. So, the overarching plot, Death on Rake, is a simple and fun one. Many years ago, a meteor that once was part of Morslib, the Chaos Moon, has fallen on Empire lands. That piece had been found and recovered by members of a noble family that ultimately changed them, their castle and even their nearby citizens. That meter resurfacing again is what we'll all be about. So this plot at this point is getting intertwined with the plot of the last book of Enemy Within, since Etelka, the woman that has provided some magical scroll helping Tugin in his ritual, also has exchanged some letters that your players might have found is a member of the Red Crown cult and they are after the same meteor as well. So now your players will proceed with their journey and they will have to encounter many interesting locations and stories that will come up and eventually find themselves getting sucked into the story of the meteor and all the bad actors that they are after it. But let's take it one step at a time. Summing up the end of the first installment of this adventure, your players will probably found themselves in one of the following outcomes. Either the portal was opened or they managed to stop the ritual and save the city. Either way, fitting to the theme of the setting and the adventure, your players are f doomed. If they stop the ritual, Gideon has made sure that they are fugitive murderers of the prominent mer merchant Medirius and probably infamous arsonists. Every guard alive in Bogenhafen and the near cities are already seeking for your party. Their faces are on drawings all over the place and people are constantly talking about the ruthless criminals that they acted in their city unchecked. Tugin had made sure to cover his trucks, so even after his demise it will be really hard for the players to find any sympathetic ear for their case. Now, on the other hand, if the players failed to stop the ritual, the unholy portal was opened and horde of demons had already devoured Bogenhafen, pushing your players along with many other survivors to seek salvation in other cities, as the demons roam the lands free. There is a possibility that the players have already found the correspondence of Atelka Herzen with Tugin, and so in that case they might have already put a target on her back. They know she is somewhere in the Black Picks near Grisenwald. So with that, your players will find themselves out of Bokenhafen and heading into the town nearby. Weisbrook, a town that they have already been to and they have a couple of reasons to go to, is a great place to start. First, if you have utilized the NPC Elvira in Bogenhafen, they will find a familiar place there to go to. Even if they didn't, Joseph, the barger, will be heading there with a bunch of refugees and his goods. Hence the players will most definitely choose to travel by river instead of heading inland, since we all know what awaits them there. Heading to Wastebrook is a fun time for any game master. You have a carte blanche to mess up with your players in so many ways depending what the outcome of your first adventure was. Did they stop the ritual? Have guards meet them on patrols is the easiest thing to do. Some more spicy ideas? Alright. 
Here we go. Assassins that have been paid by other merchants that lost so many with the end with Tugin's reign to find and punish the culprits. Manifestations of Gideon aspects may mess with his ritual and he will be most certainly messing with them constantly. Even Max, the thag from the inn where they had one of their earlier encounters, might have collected a group of thags and go for a second round depending on the previous outcomes with him. If they killed him, well the thag has a wife or a brother or a family member that has gathered the bonds of the outlaws and they seek blood and revenge. What if the city was destroyed? Well, roaming demons will be having a party with your players, constantly attacking them and messing up with their rest and their sleep. Roaming refugees will be helped and some of them might not be the best of characters to have on board. They will try to kill the group and take the bards along with all its goods. And that is only the beginning. There are so many, many more options for encounters to put here. Go crazy! The real game starts now, when all the prelude is done, we are coming back to my initial statement. People plan and God laughs. While on Berebelli or walking by the river bank, at some point they will witness a body floating down the stream with several crossbolts on its back. And lo and behold, they will sooner rather later find a barge on the river, many corpses on board, not all human, no sign of life, with a small drifting boat attached to it. On the location there are two mutants inside on the boat and a winged one that is keeping watch nearby, which will be the first to actually initiate this fight. Add to the mix a beastman that is lurking in the water and you have yourself a great little encounter to start off this adventure. Finishing the combat, the players will find five corpses on board, three human and two mutants. Searching the boat, will hear some sounds down below where a woman is scouring, initially attacking them until she is sure that they are friendly. She is Renata, a peddler, that she will give all the needed information about the old owners of the boat, along with the information about the goods that they are transporting. So now your players have a boat and some trading materials to play around with. Waysbrook now seems an even better place to stop and sell all this. Even try to find the next of kin of the dead people to claim some of the reward. Joseph and Renata insure them that the boat is theirs until someone claims it and they pay the salvage fees. Plus, they already have now their first passenger willing to show them the ropes, literally. Wastebrook will work as a pit stop for your players. Restock, deal with your trading items, seek more information about Adolfus Kuftso in any state that they have left him in your previous adventure, killed him on the attack on Berebelli, or if he escaped to be found here. The cult list of the Purple Hand will most definitely, though not, forget about them. So this is going to be their first encounter with them again. Secret signs with the lookalike of Castors. The warning of the purple hand is awesome. Having one of them have a handshake with Castor, leaving him with literally a purple hand, is a direct link to the cult, but also a very substantial threat. Little breadcrumbs for your players to have something to research and ask around for more information. The first wave of threats are simple and repetitive to ensure that the players understand that they have a very real threat that is coming after them, but have no real clue of how serious and deep this is. As they go on, the threats and the encounters will become more aggressive and dangerous. As I mentioned before, Elvira will have uh, better gravity as a plotline if you have put it into your Enemy in Shadows adventure, where the players first met her. But still, nothing is stopping you to spice up things appropriately. Perhaps she is a family member of one of your players, a teacher or a mentor, a family friend that you have not seen for ages, and what better place to seek refuge when you are on the hunt than a familiar face? So the players will have this little plotline to deal with if they wish for. Elvira is missing, her home is messed up, a threatening note can be found, and a hidden door in the cellar that holds like a 10-year-old kid, Lisa, telling the players that Elvira has been kidnapped by people and that they have taken her into the Red Barn. Now, me being me, and returning to my initial thoughts of spicing up the adventure based on the results of your party outcomes on the enemy in shadows, I would link the thugs with the players. The thugs figured out the connection of Elvira with the players, so they took her to interrogate her to find out about them. Just an idea to build some tension up. Remember that Max is a thug, and perhaps those two are connected together. Now, Elvira has been really kidnapped by Albrecht, a demonologist for Aldorf. He found out that Elvira is wanted in Aldorf, so he goes uh, for the old blackmail to get him what he wants from her. Some exotic ingredients for a powerful spell that would raise eyebrows if procured anywhere else. Using some streetwise and fast talk, your players will find the location of the Red Barn. Inside, there are three 
thugs that they're holding in Vera. Not the hardest of fights, but with some imagination you can create some fun conflict. For instance, if your players have not scouted the back of the barn and see that there is a, a pile of hayloft, the thugs could have a dagger on the throat of Alvira and threaten to kill her, or even throw her out of the upper floor of the barn, not knowing the players that there is hay there, they could think that she will be instantly killed. I realize that some people, me too sometimes, hate to have scenes or encounters that they do not push the plot forward, and this one seems to be like that, just a side quest to gain some experience and move on, it falls on your hands to not make it so. Have Elvira play some more crucial part in the story. Have her as a wise lady that might have some needed information about a resurface meteor on the barren lands, or even information about a Telka. Being a herbalist herself in big cities like Aldorf, there is a great possibility that she knows her or of her so she can be used to strengthen the link between Tugin and Atel. if you don't want to base the furthering of the adventure on a mere letter found on a safe on Tugin's place. How to do that might be only limited by your imagination. I, for one, I took an easy way out in one of my stories. I made Elvira be the sister of Helteca. Players found in her home drawings and letters from her, simple things like that to leave open hooks to my players to use in the future. You know, a bad relationship between two siblings, that the one hates another and the one is hunting them. This is free for all. Now, regarding Kufzo, in Weisbrook some thugs have worked with Kufzo and they can be located. If they want to seek out and find more information about him, they can and they will gather some that it's not really important. He was from Aldorf, he just wanted us for a job, and perhaps hand them a small link into a thief cell in Aldorf. Personally, we'll be waiting for them arriving for their inquiries, in a not very good way. Either way, because they're willing to explore the leads towards the Black Peaks and Grisenwald, or a mere follow-up of Kufzo, they will find themselves on their way to the capital once more. In Aldorf, they're going to be welcomed by a patrol, bringing them up to speed with the situation there. But for the cherry on top, one of the patrolmen is a member of the Purple Hand. A great way to show for the first time to your players that this cult has infiltrated in a very legitimate and powerful place. In the adventure, it is stated that he will not do anything to give himself up being a cult list, but I have to admit that I'm guilty in breaking that contract more often than not. Just a weird signal from the patrolman when nobody else is looking, towards Castor, a small whisper, glad you changed your mind, Master Impetimatai, is enough to mess up with your players for good. In Aldorf, the party can legitimize their bards by following the paperwork and procedures they have to do. And coming back to an earlier issue the players might have in Aldorf, such as being wanted because they were being suspected of being the murderers of a young noble, thankfully for them the culprits have been arrested, so they are on the clear. But until they find out about it, there is no harm in holding that above their heads for a little while. Some leftover leaflets with their drawn faces, might I say, might still linger around, and even someone might. I say might recognize them and call the guards, maybe, just maybe, I'm just saying. They will spend some time in prison until all this will be sorted out. Mistakes always happen, right? Right? No, 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 I've never done that, I promise. Now, with the Purple Hand knowing that Castor is back, it's their opportunity to eventually lay hands on the fortune he most definitely has. Hence, they will constantly have a tail following them. If any of the shadowing cult list is killed or taken as hostage, the players can find this note. And with that, we end the first chapter of the adventure. So, to make things even worse, we're going to introduce another cult in the second chapter. Hey, <laughs> The Red Crown Cultists. They are another Zint's cult who are opposing the Purple Hands, though, where the Purple Handers quietly gather power and influence in the Empire. The Red Crowners are dedicated in uniting the mutants and the beastmen into an army to attack from within. Etelka is one of the prominent members, along with Ernst Hedelman, the little dorky guy that your players have met at the inn when they started their adventure in Book 1. And the Crowners have found out about the meteor of Warpstone, the same old Dagmar von Wittenstein had found in Barren Hills. So Ernst has been ordered to visit Grisenwald near Nol to consult with Etelka, a leading expert in Warpstone. And there is a dedicated timeline of when the players might encounter the Red Crowns for the first time. The writers are presenting with detailed cases of times that this might happen. Just a little secret, pick the one that sounds more grande for your game. 
see what are the choices of your players and hint to them the importance of the encounter. But the range is so large you will find something that will intrigue you to run it. Time in our game is fluid. Yes, things happen at specific occasions and that makes the world feel real. But to be honest, I will a hundred times pick the most impressive and memorable scene over just math adding some solution. But that is just me. You do you. In essence, we now have two groups that are racing to get the same result. Even if your players do not know it yet, that is the case. They are racing against the Red Crown cult for reaching the meteorite. So if you like timekeeping, this is the time to have the time of your life. See what I did there? <laughs> yeah. The day column here is a clock measuring the progress of the cult list in obtaining the key. They seek to get into Dagmar's library beneath the signaling tower, but more on that later. The group will travel towards Grisenwald and they will see the signal tower. The Emperor has ordered the creation of a chain of signal towers to give warning of any attack or emergency. This, under construction site, is just that, a tower in the making. Scaffolding can be seen with dwarves working on them, hinting that this is work under progress. The players will see two dwarves waving frantically to approach the site. They are asking for a ride. They are Thingrim and Belagor, engineers of the towers. They are willing to pay good money to take them away from there. Before the players can react, another dwarf will approach them with red face from fury. She yells, unless you want to be blacklisted with all the dwarves of the empires, you will exit this barge now. Sees Ionul's Isenbird, Master at Tyson, and a woman in charge of the site. She apologizes for her workers, but they have been overworked. They will find out that things go really wrong around here. People are sleeping of the scaffolding, hammers have been falling left and right, accidents and injuries happens to a group of professionals that usually do not happen. But five days ago, disappearings started to happen. Then a couple of more dwarfs have vanished yesterday, so the rest of the crew are terrified, asking for their money and a way to leave. There's only six out of the twelve dwarfs starting in this project. So she invites the group for a hand, paying good money for it. Now we have the synopsis of the signaling tower, which was built actually 120 years ago by Dagmar von Wittenstein, a wizard and an astronomer, using it as his observatory and library. He has located an ancient tome mentioning of a meteor falling to the Empire from the Chaos Moon. His research led that the location of the fallen meteorite was in the Barren Hills, and that also coincide with the record of an incursion of chaos, concluding that the meteor possessed great power. He raised a small expedition to locate it, and according to the legend, the expedition never returned. In fact, he slew all the members of that expedition when he found the stone and brought it back home. Unfortunately, he never managed to will the fruits of his deeds, since his cousin strangled him when he refused to show the meteor to him. So many many years later, his great-great-granddaughter found his book and learned about the stone. The observer fell into ruins, with some of the protective magic of Dagmar's still active. There are three magical keys that they are associated with the tower. Each key has different aura. The first key is held by the ghoul that is located in the secret floor. This gives access to the observatory through the trapdoor or through secret doors in the outer wall. There are five other keys of the second type, carried by five zombies, guardians of the observatory. Those will open the internal doors, except the entrance to the secret library. The third and final key is located on the barren hills. This key with the five held by the zombies opens the trapdoor to the secret library of Dagmar's which holds vital information leading into the cast Wittgenstein and the end of the adventure. Information about the warp stone and a map with weird drawings will be found on the study. So the players will head for another pit stop, the town of Kemberbad, filled with trading and mentors for your players to level up their skills. Here the group can have another encounter with the followers of the Purple Hand, reminding them that no matter where they go, they will be there. A guy dressed in purple will cut a lock of Castor's lookalike's hair and run off with it. To what end? Nobody knows. And especially not your players, leaving them terrified with what might follow. And that will lead us into Chapter 3, arriving at Grissenwald. Players will pass underneath Castle Wittgenstein and they will hear all the ghastly tales. 
they will even encounter a erotic body of what it seems to be a mutant along with many stories of passing boatmen. They will find themselves on the settlement of Grisenwald and become witness and even targets of two drunk and aggressive dwarves. The townsmen are fed up with the dwarves. They used to run the nearby mines which they sold to a noble woman from Noln and now they are murderous alcoholics that they are attacking relentlessly the nearby farms, killing people and looting them and the watch does nothing for them. Now, if the players fight the aggressive dwarves and kill them, they are involved in a blood feud without even knowing it. Every night they will be attacked by 2-5 to five dwarves. A total of 14 dwarves lives in the Khazid Slewball. In reality, a group of goblins are the ones that attack the farms and do all the damage to the nearby areas. They are the allies of Etelka and the Red Crown. The money the dwarves have, that the villagers believe come from pillaging, in reality is from the hammer of their leader Gorim that has been sold to a traveling merchant and divided among its clan members, but they do not talk about it because they are heavily ashamed of it. If your players find a way to talk to the dwarves and convince them to open up, they will share with them that the evil wizard tricked them into taking their mine. She took their gold. They blame the humans for their bad reputation. The RP here with the dwarves is a free for all. It can go all possible ways. If they win them over, they might help them out with the information about the raidings that take place on the nearby farms and even go with them to the Black Peaks to help them out. If they are offending them, a fight might not take time to break out. The range is so huge. So take this beautiful time of role playing and see what your players go for. There are 14 farms around Grisenwald, all within 8 miles of the town. Three of them are laying in ruins from the raids of the goblins already. Investigating them, goblin items will be found. The rest of the farms, of course, suspects them damn dwarves. So if your players try to clear the name of the dwarves, Gorim will be grateful for their efforts and will give dwarven reinforcement, which is always good to have. When the players arrive at Grisenwald, the next goblin attack will take place. Problem is that they do not suspect which of the remaining farms will be next to be attacked. The goblin attacks every second night. The target will be the closest farm to Black Picks. If the players choose the right farm, the goblins will attack in the dead of the night with their wolves. A logical conclusion for your players will be to head to the mines and the tower of the wizard lady. So that will bring them to the south of the area. And Durak, the dwarf, will be found on the brink of death. He has killed four goblins, but he is filled with goblin arrows with his back on the tree. He will give the heads up to the players that goblins are in the mine and they are taking their gold. There is a plethora of goblins and wolves to be found here. Depending when your players will enter the mine, their adversaries will vary. Heading to the Tower of Atelka is the next step. It is working as a safe house for the wounded goblins as well as the headquarter of Gadbag, their leader. In here, you can find some interesting items such as correspondence of Atelka asking her to head to Cumberbad when she is ready some imagery of hers so that the players might identify her in the future and of course the goblin leader along with a couple of prisoners that can be saved. All in all this encounter will give the players a small push to find out who this Itelka really is and why did she buy a whole mine. Saving the forms and clearing the names of the dwarves at the same time is no small accomplishment. Allies gathered is a great way of building up help they will most certainly need in the future. Heading to Kemberbad will be the next logical step of your players, having found the letters of Aterka. Returning to the town, the Purple Hand will have another attempt to approach and talk to Castor this time. Nothing aggressive, just a final attempt to figure out what the heck he is doing. A cultist will approach Castor and will ask for his ear. This will be a great RP moment for your Castor lookalike. The cultist will ask what is the matter with him, why he hasn't been in touch and that he hopes he didn't forget of what he is supposed to do. Let your players go at it. Good RP will go a long way here. Bad one will make the cult list tell him off and leave running. Depending on the outcome, you can share some information to your players if they did well on their attempt to bluff him. Asking for info on barren hills, they will figure out people really are reluctant to help them. They even ask for huge amounts of money, a thousand gold or even more, to escort them there. The library and rumors will give them the information that the past 200 years this place is barren and infested with chaos. The players will find themselves at the village of Underbomb. 
a quiet place where they can gather information and history lore for the Barren Hills, as well as being alerted if they are not already know that there was another group that came back here not long ago, revealing Etelka and Ernst as being their antagonists. A really interesting note has been made by the writers, a note that is right at my back alley and I surely suggest to explore. The village is a really nice and safe place for your players. But is it really? So close to the Warpstone menace? It makes more sense for them to be a village of mutants hiding in this ungodly place, being ready to take the innocent visitors for their own dark reasons, sacrifices to the Chaos Gods, main deeds for their cannibalistic urges, offering to a band of beastmen to leave them alone. All are perfect. Pick and choose the one that fits your story best. Now that your players are moving into the unknown, it is a great time for me to call it quits for the first part of the Death on Rake. My strengths carried me this long and you will have to stay tuned for the second part of this adventure sooner rather later. This was the RPG Lore Master and welcome to my plague infested table. And wait, don't forget to check on my Discord server and my Patreon page. Till next time, stay safe.